You are listening to Prophet Pearls with Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson, exploring biblical prophecy for yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Shalom and welcome to Prophet Pearls from the city of truth, the faithful metropolis, the eternal capital of Israel and the Jewish people. This is Nehemia Gordon with Keith Johnson down in the sub-basement of the safe house in Jerusalem, unpacking the prophets who preached in the very place where we are recording this program Shalom. Impressive. Unpacking the prophets to preach this message in the very place. Did you do that on purpose? I love that. You sound like Isaiah. Do what on purpose? The PPPP. Oh, alliteration. Yeah. No, no, that's hot. (laughs) Hey, Maccabees, you're on again. Thank you so much. Toda Maccabees. Folks, I'm telling you something. We need more people like the Maccabees that will say, hey, whatever it takes, we're going to help you uh, be able to get this message out. And so we want to thank them. We want to thank everybody that's actually helped us. And we're actually in the what I call the prophet series, uh, I'm sorry, the Isaiah series in the prophet pearls. That's just what I call it because I like it because we're in Isaiah for you know, from now to the almost just about to the end of our our uh, our deal. But Nehemiah, um, what do you think of this? You know, this is Isaiah 40 verse. Uh, is it true? Is it 40 verse one? Is 40, it 40 verse one. Do you know what happened about 26. this? No, folks. I don't know if you know this or not. I got so frustrated about the third time of prophet pearls. We had to do Isaiah 40 verse 27. And we did the end and I was so frustrated and you said, it's okay. It's okay. Eventually we're going to get to Isaiah 40 verse one. And so now literally we did the second half of this uh, episode three. I believe it was. Correct me if I'm wrong. You, I don't know. Uh, let's see. It was episode... Episode 3 was 40 verse 27 through 41 16. Exactly. So basically, we in episode 3 of Prophet Pearls, for those that didn't hear it, get back. Previously on Prophet Pearls. <laughs> we did four, 27. And I was frustrated. I'm like, what kind of deal is this? What do you got me doing? You know, we got to do this section that's connected. What's the section that we're connected to in the Torah Pearls? That's yeah. the question. That's a... Yeah. So it's the section of Etchanan. Mm-hmm. Now... Uh, here's a little bit of a um, people don't know what that is. Now, I mean, tell me, it's Deuteronomy chapter three. Verse Deuteronomy. Three. All right, so it's Deuteronomy. Oh, hold on a second. Let me pull this up. Three twenty-three through seven through eleven. There it is. You got okay. it from Keith Johnson first. Yep. All right, and it's chapter forty, verses one to twenty-six. Now, here's where things get a little complicated. Up until this is episode forty-five, or it's the forty-fifth I section. Don't, don't we want to hear two. about the numbers. No, that's important. I'm confused. So, for the first forty-four sections of the prophets of the Haftarah. There was some sh- something in the portion which corresponded to something in the prophets. In don't tell words, me you're changing it. What? There was something, let's say, I don't know, in the portion yeah. of... Uh, Pinchas or... Pinchas, and there was some, some association they had, some word, some concept, some commandment that was found in the prophets that connected to the Torah portion. So, Wait. for seven sections, that is not the case. So you're telling me... That if I'm listening to Torah pearls, the original Torah pearls, and I get to this section, mm-hmm. and I want to go to the Haftarah section that's going to be about, like as in the previous mm-hmm. 44, yeah. you're telling me there's nothing there. Well, no. So there's a Haftarah section. There's a prophet section. I understand there's a prophet. But it's not associated with the Torah, for the Torah portion. And why, and why is this? So there are seven Haftarot, or seven prophets portions, which are um, called the sections of comfort. And, um, and it begins with this section, chapter 40, verse 1. Um, which you know starts here. It says, "Nachamu, nachamu, ami, comfort, oh comfort, my people," says your God. And so, why is this the sections of comfort, the seven sections of comfort? Because uh, in the in the in the traditional reading cycle in, in the rabbinical synagogues, uh, these are the seven prophets portions read from Tisha B'av to Rosh Hashanah. Now, that what means is, that means the ninth day of the fifth Hebrew month, which the rabbis call Tisha, ninth of Av. Mm-hmm. They call it by the Babylonian name Av, ninth of Av, until Yom Truah, which they call Rosh Hashanah, the day of uh, shouting or trumpets. They call it the head of the year. So why do you have seven se- sessions between the ninth of Av and the um, Rosh Hashanah? Because according to uh, rabbinical tradition, the temple was destroyed on the ninth of Av in the se- year 70 AD. And, the sec- and the, both the first and second temples mm-hmm. were destroyed in the, on the ninth of Av. One, the first one in, in um, well, they give a different date. But historians say 586 BCE and 70 AD for the second temple. Now I say by tradition because in the Tanakh we're actually told that, that the city of Jerusalem burned from the 7th to the 10th for four days um, in, in the first temple. And then Josephus tells us it actually burnt in the 10th. So, But whatever, the 9th is close enough. So the 9th of Av is, is and according Wait, to... telling me the tradition is not 100% right? Well, so it's interesting. So what happened on the 9th of Av that actually happened was the defeat of the Bar Kokhba uprising in 135 AD. So the rabbi said, oh, that's the 9th of Av. These other things are like the 7th, the 10th. We're just going to 
Backtrack that. Backtrack that and keep a straight line and come up with a bunch of things that happened on the 9th of Av, even though they were the 10th or the 7th. You know, what's a few days between you, me and you? Um, as Abraham said to Ephron. <laughs> so, um, this is, yeah, anyways. Look, was it, it the 4th of July or not? Are you, you going to take away the 4th of July? Maybe it was the 3rd of July or the 6th of July. or the. Come on, you know. Okay. Anyway, so long story short, um, 9th of Av is by tradition when the temp- temples were destroyed and the Bar Kokhba revolt was put down, etc., and a bunch of other things. Um, and so from the 9th of Av, the sh- all, every Shabbat from the 9th of Av until Rosh Hashanah, they read seven Haftarot, seven prophet sections, which are from the comfort portions of Isaiah, uh, chapters 40 through 66. Remember, we talked about mm-hmm. Isaiah has three sections. There's the rebuke, there's the warning if you don't obey the rebuke, and there's the, the, um, the uh, you know, the... Um, the comfort and, and really the concept here is, is there's this um, I guess there's this concept of we're going from destruction, which is represented by the ninth of Av to Rosh Hashanah or the day of the trumpets when we blow the shofar for the redemption. Mm-hmm. And so this these prophecies are getting us through, you know, it's, it's the they're getting us from the destruction of the temple through the exile to the final redemption symbolically. And so the annual, this annual reading of the cycle in the rabbinical tradition echoes the patterns of prophetic history. That's okay. the idea. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I would like to read the first verse like this, if it's okay. Sure. Nehemiah, Nehemiah, my people says you're God. <laughs> no, I'm telling you folks, I want to read it that way. Nehemiah, why would, look, if I wanted to create something like that, if I wanted to, how close would I be? Those first two words, how close is it to your name? Okay, so my name is Nehemiah, which mm-hmm. is, means Yah comforts, Yehovah mm-hmm. comforts. And it's mm-hmm. from the same, this is the word of the week, obviously, Nachamu. Nachamu what do you mean obviously? It has to be. The, the <laughs> next seven portions, this and the next six portions after are based on this word. Yeah. Nachamu means comfort. Um, and, and technically it's what we call an imperative. It's like, go, walk, sit, you know, yep. command. Um, and so nachamu is the plural. Mm-hmm. It really is comfort ye, you know, mm-hmm. y'all. Comfort all y'all. Comfort all y'all. Comfort all y'all, my people, says your God. So you're supposed to be walking in your name. You're supposed yeah. to be a guy of comfort. Mm-hmm. I'm sitting down here in the sub-basement. You're, you're not comfortable. Room. I'm not comfortable. <laughs> I'm not comfortable at all. <laughs> well, I want to comfort people with the word of God. And sometimes giving them the word of God makes them uncomfortable. And, so, and that's okay because in the end it will comfort them so, if they so embrace really that it. that kind of fits. We're so, doing the word of God in an The root is nun chet mem. Nun yeah. chet mem as in Nehemiah or Nachamu. Comfort, comfort, my comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. And I don't know if you know this, but this is actually a really important verse. Mm. A really important. First of all, it's the opening of chapters forty through sixty-six. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is actually this is one of my favorite verses in the Tanakh. I know you make fun of me, but really, this is in the top fifty hundred favorite it's gotta verses. Got to be your name. Root of your name is twice. Not just because my name. So I want I want to share a very interesting event in Jewish history that happened related to this verse. May I do that? Please do. Okay. This is something that happened on July 31st, 1920. Mm-hmm. Now, 1917, between 1517 and 1917, the Turks rule Israel. Mm-hmm. 1917, the, the British fight the Turks, and they gradually drive the Turks out. Finally, in 1920, they appoint the first British high commission, what's called the first high commissioner of Palestine mm-hmm. under the British. Now, when they're saying Palestine, they're not thinking Palestinian Arabs. What they're thinking is... The um, the Romans called Judea. They renamed it in 135 AD. They renamed it uh, Palestina in mm-hmm. Ro- in Latin, and then the Arabs called it Philistine. And now the British are calling it Palestine. Um, and Palestinians at, at this point in history are Jews who live in Palestine. Mm-hmm. Um, so the first High Commissioner of Palestine under the British rule, he, his name was Herbert Samuel, mm-hmm. and he was a Jew. Mm-hmm. He was a British Jew, and um, and this was considered a really big deal. Because Herbert Samuel, he's the first Jewish ruler over Israel in 2,000 years. Mm-hmm. And you say, oh, he wasn't you know, really Jewish. He, I mean, he was Jewish, but he was British, right? Mm-hmm. But think about the man I'm named after, Nehemiah. He was a Persian. He was the guy who held the cup for the king of Persia. Mm-hmm. So he was a Persian governor, mm-hmm. the Nehemiah I'm named after. Um, he was a Persian royal official. And, um, and, and so Herbert Samuel is seen as a latter-day Nehemiah, mm-hmm. a latter-day Zerubbabel as mm-hmm. well who is also a, a Persian official. Um, so Herbert Samuel, he, he comes to Israel, and within a week of arriving in Israel, he does something really radical. He comes to the Chorva Synagogue in the old city of Jerusalem, and they say, oh, you're the high commissioner of Palestine, you represent the British, but you're a Jew. Would you honor us by reading the Haftarah portion? Mm. And he comes and he stands up on the platform, the Bimah, and he begins to read 
Nachamu, nachamu ami. <laughs> be comforted, be comforted by people. <laughs> and imagine this. No, no, no. This, this no, no. is the high. The Where is that synagogue? Jewish, no, no. What do you mean? This you is the one. central synagogue in the old city of Jerusalem in the Jewish quarter. You look at the old city of Jerusalem from any angle and you see the Jewish quarter. And the first thing you see is the core of a synagogue. It is the heart of... Of the synagogues in the old, obviously the heart of the old city is is the Western Wall. But yeah. if the Jewish quarter, which is up on a hill above the the, mm-hmm. the Western Wall, um, the heart of the old, of the Jewish quarter is the core of a synagogue. To this very, it was actually wow. it was destroyed by the the Jordanians. They recently rebuilt it, and you see this dome from everywhere. Mm-hmm. You see the old city. So imagine that. So Herbert Samuel. He, uh, he comes and he, he reads this. Can you imagine this? Imagine you're a Jew and you're sitting in the audience and you've been living in Israel for years and you're ruled by these Turks who treat you like a second-class citizen. By law, as a Jew, you were a second-class citizen under the, uh, under the Muslims. There's a great, um, not a great, a tragic account about um, this, um, this, this Muslim ruler over there where he sentences one of his people to death for breaking the law and somebody comes into the before the, the sultan. And he says, but the Jew, that Jew did the same thing. He said, oh, well, let's kill the Jew then. We don't want to kill one of our own. We got to make an example of somebody. Let's kill the Jew. That's what it was like under Muslim rule. And now all of a sudden there's a Jew who's the first governor of Israel in 2000 years. And he comes and he reads, be comforted, be comforted, my people. You, you, this is no small thing. I want to, now the, there was a man at the, who was present named Eliezer Ben Yehuda. No, he wasn't there. He was there in the synagogue. Oh, I he was there in the synagogue. This. Folks, we're going to turn the rate. Hold on. You can't tell this. Eliezer Ben Yehuda. Oh, you can't tell this without telling me first. No, this is golden. What are you talking now, about? Eliezer Ben Yehuda is the Jew who almost single-handedly revived the Hebrew language. Absolutely. He arrived in Israel in 1880. And he started speaking Hebrew, and people thought he was crazy. Yes. This was the language of synagogue. It was the language of, you know, when you would study Torah, you wouldn't speak it in the street. And he, he actually, his son was the first native Hebrew speaker in um, yes. over a thousand years, yes. or a thou- something like a thousand yes. years. And by 1920, there's an entire generation who was raised up speaking Hebrew. Mm-hmm. And, um, and he came to the synagogue. And now you have to wow. say something about Ben Yehuda. He was a secular Jew. In fact, he was excommunicated by the rabbis, which is a really big deal. The rabbis don't – I haven't even been excommunicated yet. <laughs> it's like you getting kicked out of the Methodist church. Hey, leave that alone. No. So, the, so, they, um, so they actually formally excommunicated Eliezer Ben Yehuda. Um, for being, he was act, he Lama. wasn't just secular. He was Lama. anti-religious. Okay, he said, "You religious people kept us in exile for two thousand years. It's time to throw off the shackles of the exile and return to our homeland and speak our language." And they said, "Heretic, we must speak, you know, the language we spoke in exile." And, and there were Jews in Israel who were speaking Yiddish, which is a dialect of German, and other Jews who were speaking Arabic, other Jews who were speaking Turkish. They said, "We'll speak any language, but not Hebrew." Eliezer Ben Yehuda changed it, mm. so he shows up at the synagogue. Uh, and this is the first time he'd been at synagogue in years. And why was he there? Because he knew the high commissioner was coming there. And it was the first Shabbat after the, the Herbert Samuel arrived. And here's what he wrote to his wife, whose name was Beatty. Beatty was actually her, her nickname, her loving nickname. It means my daughter mm-hmm. or my lady. He says, our friend, the high commissioner, mm-hmm. I'm getting emotional. Our friend, the high commissioner read from the Torah, Beatty. He read those lines from Isaiah, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. As he read them, I could not control myself. I cried, I cried, BT, and I guess people saw me. I'm sure they wondered why I was there. For nearly 40 years, I have been working to separate religion from state, haven't I? This is Eliezer Ben Yehuda writing. I did it because I wanted Israel to be able to develop freely so that those who are Orthodox and those who are free thinkers could join in the resurrection of Israel. Only in that way could our new state ever be strong. He goes on, I suppose some people will think that now I am a traitor to my own ideas. They are always accusing me of that. I still believe we must keep our religion and our state apart. But BT, it is no, it is so good a thing to see a British High Commissioner standing in the synagogue reading from the Torah. Wow, um, wow. Now <laughs> this is, I can't emphasize how huge this was. Um, you know, Herbert Samuel's reading of this particular pro- of all the prophecies, he he just happened to show up <laughs> in Israel, in Palestine, in Jerusalem that week. And this is the first week he comes to the synagogue, and 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 it was quite literally seen as as the official pronouncement of the end of the third exile. The, mm. Him reading these words in the synagogue, and we had three exiles: four hundred years in Egypt, seventy years in Babylon, one thousand eight hundred fifty years at the hands of Rome. This is how the Jews of the time described it. Mm. And Ben Yehuda, the secular anti-religious Jew, he's his reacting so strongly was seen as a confirmation 
of the gravity of this event. And he hears a witness who was there in the synagogue wrote as follows. Wow. He says, I was in... <laughs> he says, I was in the core of a synagogue the day the end of the third... Can he read this? Mm. He says, I was in the core of a synagogue the day the end of the third exile was officially pronounced. Mm. Again, people, this is... um. This is uh, July 31st, 1920, Shabbat, the old city of Jerusalem. The British high commissioner is reading, comfort you come from my people. He says, Ben Yehuda was also there. This is a witness who saw him. I was near enough to see him so I could, near enough to him so I could see the tears streaming down his face. I saw the look in his eyes. I knew then what I had always suspected. Down underneath it all, Ben Yehuda had a deeply religious soul. He has fought superstition and bigotry and fanaticism, but that does not mean he is not a good and humble man. Mm. So, wow. Um, this is a big deal. This, this prophecy for 2,000 years kept Jews, gave them some sense of hope. And then for this to be read in this, and imagine the hopes around this. We've been ruled by the Muslims for, for over a 1,000 years. We had the Crusaders and the Muslims and, and, and the Turks. And, and then the British came. And, they, and you remember the background of the British here of invading Israel is they made the Balfour Declaration mm-hmm. in which they declared that... Um, Palestine would be the homeland of the Jewish people. They, they recognized what God had already commanded. Mm-hmm. And then during the negotiations um, with the League of Nations, which gave the British official international recognition over so-called Palestine, the purpose of the, of the Palestine mandate was to establish a Jewish home in, in mm-hmm. Israel. Mm-hmm. And the first commissioner is, is a Jew. And he's reading in the synagogue. And even this anti-religious Jew, his heart is just stirred up by these words. Mm. Be comforted, be comforted, my people, coming from the first Jewish ruler in 2,000 years. Uh, and, and, you know, it's interesting, too, because now we're talking about that, which is real history. You know, this is prophecy for yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And I really, I really appreciate you sharing that story, Nehemiah, because there's so many levels that, um, that are amazing. Um, but the other thing that's amazing is that we've had this idea... Uh, in the seminaries, we've taught in the seminaries that there are two Isaiahs, that the one that we talked about in the first part is different than this one because this one is just two, as we call them, Nehemiah, the eagle eye prophet. He sees too clear for him to be able to be prophesying now in 40 verse 1 about the future. And then you bring that story. I mean, is that what Isaiah saw? Did you see that plus other things? I mean, it's a... Yeah. It's like it's like. Well, and, and can yeah. I tell you how this is seen even to this day by many mm-hmm. Jews? So I actually grew up being taught that um, that we were in a period of history called Atchalta de Geulta, the beginning of the redemption, mm-hmm. and and you could argue whether it began in 1917 with the invasion of the British or it began on July 31st, 1920, with the reading of this prophecy. But many Sometime Jews, in many mm-hmm. Jews believe that the redemption is described in a number of places in prophecy about, uh, as the uh, as the birth pangs. Mm-hmm. It talks about a woman uh, in travail giving mm-hmm. birth, and if you think about birth pangs. Uh, and you've had three sons. Mm. I don't know. Were you in the room? Or were you hiding? I out was the cigar? absolutely in the room. Okay. Uh-huh. Um, so if you think about birth pangs, so it's a process. The mm. baby doesn't get born in one second, mm. right? I mean, it could be many hours depending on you know the woman. And so the, many Jews look at this and say, we are currently in the birth pangs of the Messiah. That's what it's called. And, that, and uh, that's the birth pangs of the Messiah. I've talked about that before, I think. And and you know, and we look and we say, oh, you know, wait a minute. After this, there was the Holocaust. Yeah, it hurts. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not, there's I, wars, I, there's pain. I, 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 I this is the birth pangs of the Messiah. While I'm down here in the sub basement, folks, you know, Nehemiah leaves me here by myself. Oftentimes, you know, I, I sometimes sneak out and, and, and catch him. But while I've been here, I've been looking at history. You know, and, and you know, we prepared our prophet pearls. This is the third time through, and so I was doing some, uh, I was doing some research just about this issue of the Palestinian issue. And, and Palestine, and you just, you hit the nail right on the head, Nehemiah, as far as the naming of the uh, Palestine and what presently they call uh, the Palestinians. But, but what, I, what what's so powerful to me is when, when verse 2 says, if I can't, please, can please. I please? Oh my gosh, I'll try not speak, to cry. No, please cry as much as you speak want. Speak to is the beautiful. heart of Jerusalem. Let me, let me I, okay, so speak. Proclaim to her. Go on, you read it. <laughs> No, no, I'm trying to get it. He'll start weeping again. Go on. No, no it's, 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 this is really special time. And call out to her that her and 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 here's the word that they're using here, uh, tzava, which is you know you use it tzava ot, but it says that her warfare has ended. Now think about this. So Isaiah's Isaiah's there, and you know like this they say so it's too it's too it's too clear it's too straightforward it's too prophetic for him. It's got to be a different Isaiah. 
for him to say that. And and you just brought this example. And what was going on in the, in, 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 in the 17, 1917, 1920, going on into Israel declaring itself as this war, 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 war. You know, and then say her war still going on. Yeah, and war still going on. That's why it's the beginning. It goes from warfare to that her iniquity has been removed, Mm -hmm. and then it goes on to say, and you know, you talked about birth pangs that she's received of Yehovah's hand, and I I I don't know if this is can this be correct Mm -hmm. that she's received dual or double 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 all her sins. Man, oh man, and and that of course you know. References Exodus twenty two seven verse mm-hmm. six in the Hebrew, mm-hmm. where if you steal, you actually have to pay back double, mm-hmm. and and that you know that's that metaphorically now uh, Israel is getting you know being paid back double for her iniquities. It's mm-hmm. wow, and it, isn't that the truth? Look at the Holocaust. Look at all the suffering that we've gone mm-hmm. through. Um, you know, and, and, and I, can I just say something here about verse two? So you, you translated it as her iniquity has been removed, and mm-hmm. I'm wondering is there other trans? Because I, I didn't even look in the English. Let's see if what, mm-hmm. cause that's not what it says in Hebrew. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. I love when this happens. Yep. Um, JPS has um, that her iniquity is expiated. Mm-hmm. I love that word expiated. It's so vague. Who knows what it means? Mm-hmm. Her iniquity is pardoned in King James ver- uh, mm-hmm. Version. Um, NRSV has her penalty is paid. Can I tell you what it says in the Hebrew? What is it like? Make amends or restore? No, what is the it? word is nirza, which yeah. means accepted. It's a, mm-hmm. we, I think we had this as a word mm-hmm. of the week, maybe, or, or we've definitely talked we about did. it. Ratsa in biblical Hebrew means to be accepted and a, a sacrifice being accepted. And if I had to translate this knowing, you know, just just without any kind of agenda, I'd say her iniquity offering has been accepted. Mm-hmm. Wow. Wow. Her sin offering or literally iniquity has been accepted. Well, she's received her double. Offering. She's received double wow. from Yehovah's hand uh, for all mm-hmm. of her sins. Wow. And, and then, of course, I, I mean, Nehemia, you know, the thing the thing is, if we were to talk about if we were to talk about this, this, this section that's coming. Wait, um, I, I, no, before we, yeah, go before ahead. We go on. No, 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 go ahead. I got to offer my drosh, my, my, um, my uh, homiletical interpretation of this. Okay. The deeper meaning. So here we've got this commandment, if, Exodus 22, 7, verse 6 in, the, or 6 in the Hebrew, 7 in the English. If a man shall deliver unto his neighbor money or stuff to keep, and it be stolen out of the man's house, if the thief be found, let him pay double. So why do we have to pay double for our sins? Mm. And I'm just thinking out loud here. This is me going off the reservation. Israel was entrusted to guard the Torah, mm-hmm. and we let it get stolen, and now we've got to pay, we had to pay double. Move on. And what do we pay for that? What do you mean? This is your opinion on that. Two thousand years of suffering. No, no, no. That's it. No, I'm saying this. This is your. This is your. Uh, you, you thought about that. That's my thought. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's why you said we had to pay double. Okay. Maybe I don't know. It's just the thought. Okay. Yeah. Now, now this is the verse you have wanted to get to. Right? No, I wouldn't say I wanted to get to because it's interesting. I, 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 you know, when I read this verse, I, I keep asking myself, like, why is it? Why is? It, here's here's what the issue is. So there are some verses that for me and my heritage and my background, that when I hear the verse, I don't think of where, where it came from, the concept. Mm-hmm. And there are times now where I actually am confused. I will. I want to make a confession. Yeah. I'm sitting here right now, and I'm like, a voice is calling, clear the way of Jehovah in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. And let rough ground become a plain and the rugged train a broad valley. The, let me stop there. So I'm thinking, a voice is calling, clear the way. And I'm thinking now, is that did I first hear that at the end of the book? Did I hear that in the New Testament first, or was that something I first learned in Isaiah? And I guarantee you, I didn't first um, get it in Isaiah. Meaning, in my I'm talking about in my tradition, right? And 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 that's where there's been a bit of a shift with me, yeah. Where I've had to ask myself when I read something or I've read something, I've actually been forced now, Nehemiah. To, to say where does it come from and where what you know what what was its original context yeah. and then going back and saying okay so what does it mean there so let me so can I yeah. explain what the real issue is for yeah. so let me read Matthew chapter three verse three mm-hmm. uh, it's speaking about John the Baptist it says for this is he that was spoken of through the through Isaiah the prophet saying quote the voice of one crying in the wilderness make ye ready the way of the Lord make his path straight mm-hmm. and and the issue here is really where we put the comma because mm-hmm. when we read it in the Hebrew what we read is Um, For example, the New Revised Standard Version, which is a Christian translation, but still gets it right based in the Hebrew. Mm -hmm. A voice cries out, quote, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord in Hebrew, Mm -hmm. make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Um, And again, this is an image we've seen or or maybe we'll get to more um, Mm -hmm. where we see Yehovah coming from the desert. That's the image. You know, Yehovah Mm -hmm. comes from Mm -hmm. the desert of the south. 
uh, from Sinai, from Horeb, from uh, Seir. Um, and that's the image here. God's coming. We better get ready. We better prepare the way for him. Mm-hmm. And um, w- what's interesting here is is, is is the voice crying out, comma, quotation, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Or is the voice crying out in the wilderness, comma, quotation, prepare the way of the Lord. And, and this is this is really interesting to me because I've actually read um, scholarly discussions about this that said Matthew took it out of context and misunderstood it. He thought the voice was in the wilderness and John the Baptist is the voice. And so John the Baptist is saying, prepare the way of the Lord, as opposed to the voice is crying out, prepare the way of the Lord in the wilderness. Mm-hmm. And I look back in the Greek of the Septuagint and the Greek of Matthew, mm-hmm. and it's not so clear that the Greek got it wrong. In other words, you could legitimately translate even the Greek of Matthew as a voice cries out, mm-hmm. quote, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Mm-hmm. Meaning there's no commas in the Greek. Right. So isn't that interesting? They mm-hmm. said, oh, here's what the Hebrew means in context. No question about that. Here's what the, what the Greek of, of the, the New Testament means in context. The Greek, the New Testament got it wrong. But actually, I think they're saying the same thing. I, I don't see any difference no, no. reading it in the Greek. Mm-hmm. Now, I've yes. spoken to a Greek expert about this. He said, yeah, the, the, you could read it either way. There's no commas in the Greek. You know, and, and I think that's the, <laughs> that part, is- that's the part that I said where, where I first would hear something. Because then I, it's, it's, it's like this. I want to, mm-hmm. please, please bear with me and be, yeah. be patient with me. So you, you hear comfort, comfort my people. Yeah. Then in 1920, this man stands up and he, and he uses that, and he says that text, comfort, comfort my mm-hmm. people. And, and then you're, if you're sitting there, you're, you're interpreting it and you're saying, okay, was this, the, was this the act that Isaiah was talking about? Meaning, in other words, was that the act that Isaiah was talking about? Or is it something that's continued? And then when I get to Matthew and I hear that, yeah. so then I just ask myself, so so what is, you know, and again, we're not talking about you know the New Testament right here. We're talking about Isaiah and its original language, history, and context. But it causes me to ask, so what was the interpretation? And I appreciate mm-hmm. the fact that you yeah. brought up. You brought that up. It's just one of those issues. Well, and verse, verse 5 is the key verse for yeah. understanding the original context. Can, we read, can you read me verse 5? Yeah. Okay, so I already mentioned already every hill lifted up, etc. Right, then, sure. so we're preparing the way, and now what happens after we prepare the way? Yeah, 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 yeah. Then the glory of Jehovah will be revealed. Oh man, that's the point. And yes, and the all flesh will see it together. All right, for the mouth of now, Jehovah has spoken. So there, you could say, well, Matthew uh, took it out of context because not all flesh was revealed then, but he actually didn't quote that part of the prophecy. Mm-hmm. No, he didn't. He's taking these particular this particular verse and saying, okay, here's an application of that. Mm-hmm. Um, not that necessarily that's what Isaiah was always talking about, because Isaiah the key in Isaiah is verse five mm-hmm. for this. And then, by the way, this is a single prophecy, verses three through five. Mm-hmm. We got little spaces in Hebrew to see that that's a separate prophecy. Verse six is already another prophecy, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and and what does it mean? A voice crying out. In the wilderness, prepare a way of the Lord. So Isaiah's in a vision, and he sees something. And what does he see? He actually doesn't see anything. He hears. That's right. A voice crying out. And what yes. does the voice cry out? Make way. In, in the wilderness, prepare a way for Yehovah. Mm-hmm. Make straight in the Aravah mm-hmm. a highway for our God. Mm-hmm. Okay. So okay. that's that's actually this classic image of Yehovah coming from the desert of the south. Wow. From Sinai. And then it says again, though. Now another then then, Verse six. then a voice and a voice, a voice says out. again, yeah, call out. Is that what it's saying? Yeah, the voice says to him, call out. Yeah, he just tells, <laughs> and he said, what shall I call out? This reminds me of where he says, you know, uh, read. What shall I? You know, I can't read. I don't know how to read. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the other guy says, well, I can't read because it's sealed. Remember that? <laughs> <In> exactly. <Isaiah>. <laughs> <laughs> All flesh is grass, and its loveliness is like the flower of the field. That's what you're going to cry out. The grass mm-hmm. withers, the flower fades when the breath of Yehovah blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. It doesn't last for long. Mm. It withers, the flower fades, but the and this you know and I'm we're gonna, uh, this is a pick and choose. It's a pick and choose time, folks. It's pick, pick and, and choose. And choose. Okay. Meaning this we is the verb, no, we can't do the whole thing. But I, I I love the I love the last part of this phrase in Isaiah forty verse eight. And I just want to look at it real here. Um. Uh, and the word of Yehovah stands or rises or you know, it, it it stands. For, I could say, just for a thousand years, no, Leolam, it stands forever. His word stands forever. And so what a great what a great thing to invest in when I say by our time, our energy, and I dare say even our resources where we, where we can do everything we can to try to understand what the word of God says, what it means, how it can apply in our life, because that's something that stands forever. It's mm-hmm. not, in other words, he didn't speak it and say, okay, now it's done. But he spoke it, it's written, it's for us, and we can understand it in its language history and context wow yep 
So, um, so now verses, yeah, yeah, verses nine to eleven is the next prophecy, and I, and I can we just read that as a unit? I love this passage. Please, you read this one. No, you read it. No, please. no, no. You gotta. I, do I'm it. gonna read verse nine. Mm. Uh, Upon a high mountain, go up for yourself, O herald of Jerus of Zion. Is that what you have? Halimi bakoch kolech. Raise up in strength your voice, O uh, herald, uh, announcer of good tidings of Jerusalem. Raise up, do not be afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Hine Elohechem, behold no, no, no. I let God. you read it because you didn't want to say this. Get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Yeah. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Amen. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the city of Judah, of Judah, here is your God. Now, when they say yeah. twice in the NASB, yeah, good news. Good news twice. It's a good translation because the word is mivaseret. Mivaseret. Now, mivaseret means announcer. So, or where were you reading? Where, 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 where I was you... reading from the Hebrew. I was uh, kind of you free You decided you didn't want to do mivaseret. Well, it's announcer, the announcer of good news. Yeah. Okay, but it could also be the announcer. Do you remember of bad when news, we, by we the were way. in mivaseret? When you remember when we went mivaseret over? Mivaseret is the name of a city today. Yeah. yeah do you town. remember where we yeah. went there? Uh, no. You when don't go there. You when do we go you there? You forget all these. I've been there many you times. You know what's funny? And you were there I'll once. Honest, I've been there a hundred no, times. I'll be honest with you. Sometimes I had really significant things. And I'll say, so what do you remember? And you'll say, no, I don't know. I don't yeah, know anything. What happened in Mivaseret? We, we had radio interviews over there with the Oh, folks. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That was in Mivaseret. Oh, you're right. Okay. I've been there lots of times in Mivaseret. You've been, like I said, you've been there once. It's a big deal for you. I you know what kind of, I want to stop, folks. I want to tell you something that happens sometimes. Yeah. So you know, there always this happens with the with the husband and the wife, and 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 the, and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and you know they'll, they'll forget certain things, and the the husband will say, "Do you remember when?" or the wife will say, "Do you remember when?" And he'll say, "No." And and sometimes I, I you know, Nehemiah, you, you you don't remember really important things, and I, I want you to I want you, you to remember these kinds that are of, important to you. And so, the reason I said yeah. it was important, yeah. let me just tell you okay. why. Yeah, yeah. Because it was the first time that um, I had ever heard good news mm. uh, in English, which mm. had a certain image in my mind. And then this word Mivaseret. Yeah. And and then we were in this place. Yeah. And for me, you have to understand it was like it was like a really big deal because I was like, wow, how is this word used and, and how is it translated and how did we get to good news in English in this like in here in Isaiah in ASB? Mm-hmm. You know, what was what was the the, the process or, yeah. or or whatever? And and again, like I say, it's just another one of those examples where I'm in the land of Israel at the actual place that's named that. Yeah. So the, the town in English, I could, I could have said yeah. the town's named Good News. Announcer of Good News. Announcer of Mivaseret Good News. Mivaseret is yeah. the announcer of Good News. And and now you studied at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, right? And yes. you got your master's in yes. divinity or something yes. like Cum that. Yes, laude. Are you kidding me? Cum laude. So yeah. do you remember what the Greek word for gospel is? Because you're talking about e, 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 you know, the, evangelion, right? Evangelion, Okay. Yes. Evangelion is gospel. And so here's the interesting thing. I looked in the Septuagint, the ancient Greek translation of Isaiah, uh, in this case, and it, and it, and the Greek translation of Mivaseret, announcer of good news, is evangelizomenos, which means someone who announces good news. Mm. Someone who, and, and li, you could translate it literally as evangelist. So now, now can you read me the word, the verse with evangelist? Yes. Um, re, read it now. So word evangelist. Yeah. Uh, you mean evangelist? Uh, so in other words, because that's the Greek word evangelizomenos. Oh, Zion bearer. Oh, what, what verse are we in? Yeah, no, no, verse no. forty nine. Forty no, verse 40 nine. Verse nine. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, evangelist of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, evangelist of good tidings. Lift it up. Do not fear. Say to the seas of Judah, here is your God. Now, here's why this is interesting to me. Uh, not because of the connection with evangelist. And that, that is interesting. And actually, that is, you know, obviously, evangelion in, in the New Testament context means the good news, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, is that known in the Christian yep, world? Yep. Okay. So, um, so, but here, this word announcer of good tidings, announcer of good news, is in the feminine. Mm-hmm. It's a woman who announces it. It's a female evangelist. Isn't that interesting? You're getting better. No, this is part of your this feminist is... agenda. Yeah. Um, but it's but this is a fact. It's in the feminine. It says mivaseret tzion, not, and, and you could say in Hebrew mivaseret tzion, mm. a, a male who announces the good news. Why is it that the woman is announcing good news? Because this was a role that people had. You know, mm. they didn't have internet. They didn't have CNN. They didn't have Twitter. If there was news that needed to be spread, there was a woman who would travel on that round and say. Did you hear the good news? We defeated the Babylonians. Did you hear the good news? The king, the, there's a new king and he's been anointed in Jerusalem at the Gihon Spring. Did you hear the good news? Uh, the, you know, the king has now 400 chariots. And this was a job of certain women that would go around and they would go to the city and they would start to, they would raise up their voice at the top of their lungs and they would say, Solomon has been anointed king. 
Solomon is the Mashiach, and they would announce this to the cities of Jerusalem. Announce it, and and the, what the prophet is talking about was something everybody knew from daily life. There were women who traveled around, and they would announce news. And in this particular case, the woman comes around and she says, Hine Elohechem, behold your God. Hine Adonai Yehovah, behold Lord Yehovah. Bechazak Yavoz Ra'o he will come in strength. And his his uh, arm will rule over, will be mighty and rule. It's beautiful. You get the image of what's happening. The woman, she's going around. She's standing in the public square and saying, Behold! What? She's the evangelist. This is impressive. No, I no, I really, I really do. I really do love that. And do you have any examples where we can read in Scripture and where we see a woman going out and then making those announcements? Well, here's one right here. Uh, no, no, this is, I mean, obviously here, he's... It, it, it's saying this is in the feminine, but I'm talking about an, an, ex, an example where it says, and she came and she announced. Do, do, can you think of that? Like, I wonder, like, for well, example, I think when about the, the king, woman, the, Tekoa the king, woman, okay, woman from Tekoa, or uh, when the king was, uh, when the king was anointed and she, you know, I'm, I'm just, tr- I'm trying to think of an, of an example like that while you're doing that. That was some good, that was, boy, that was good stuff there. Can you think of that? Yeah, that's what I'm going to bring it here. Hold okay. on a second. Um, you're asking me to pull stuff out here. Okay. So there's the woman from Tekoa who comes and she makes the announcement. Was it to King David or something? Mm-hmm. Oh, wait, I'm only looking at Isaiah. Hold on. Um, here, this is in 2 Samuel chapter 14, verse 4. Um, and this is a little different because she's coming for the king. And Joab sent her. Um, oh, it's verse 4 is where he's telling her to do it. When she actually does it is verse 9 or mm-hmm. so. So let me see. Um, okay. So verse, f- okay, yeah, it's in here somewhere. Let's just edit out this. Hesitation. Okay, the king asked her, what troubles you? And she answered, alas, I am a widow. My husband is dead. Your maidservant had two sons. And she tells her whole story. So so it's not un- it's not strange for him to have this woman who's coming. And she says, look, I've got this issue I need to talk to you about. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Do you have an example of a woman coming? Well, no, I was trying to think. And actually, I can't think of it at the top of my head. Yeah, but I was thinking about when the, the king was, um, when the king was uh, anointed and she, she, she came and said, but you know what? Like, look, I'd have to check. I'd okay. have to check. But what's interesting is that in later Jewish tradition, this, this reality continued that women would make announcements and they would tell, you know, tell mm-hmm. the news. But then we, we've turned this into a negative thing. We have in Jewish tradition, I don't know if you've ever heard this, this figure of the Yenta. Hmm. The Yenta is the woman gossiper who goes around telling the news. Well, um, I, I think that's part of this anti-woman agenda. And mm. that originally the woman who would, would be announced, she was an evangelist. She was announcing the good news. Amen. You know? Amen. Um, she, Amen. She was the Twitter of her day. Amen. Wow. Yeah. So, um, verse 12 is a new prophecy. Verse 12 is a new prophecy. Can I go to it? Please. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Uh, we could have a revival off of that right there. Mm. And mark the heavens by the span or you know oh no 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 it can't be no 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 he has measured the heavens with his pinky is what it's in hebrew yep (laughs) yeah (laughs) it's so beautiful yeah and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure yeah and weighed the mountains in a balance and the hills on a pair of scales who has directed the spirit of yehovah or as his counselor has informed him. You know, I, really? I, that's what you have directed? That's what, it says, that's what it says, directed. What? Yeah. No, it's the same word as in verse 12 where it says he has measured the, the mm-hmm. heavens with his pinky. Mm-hmm. And it literally means who has measured the spirit of Yehovah. Mm-hmm. And the point is the spirit of Yehovah is infinite. It can't be measured. Amen. Amen. Well, who's counseled him? Nobody. Who sat him down and said, look, your, your, it's your, a approach, question. The answer is your approach that you're taking right now yeah. with the nations is just not wise. Let's yeah. give you some advice <laughs> that, that that just doesn't happen. Yeah. Now, here's an interesting um, kind of tidbit, which this is more for the advanced people. Mm-hmm. And that's um, in verse 13. He says, who has measured the spirit of Yehovah and um, the Masoretes? These were the, the scribes who preserved the Hebrew text mm. and they preserved the accents and the vowels. So they actually did something a little bit controversial here. Um, and, and we have Jewish sources that, that point this out. The Masoretes apparently, according to the Jewish sources, changed the accents in this verse. Mm-hmm. And instead of making it, who has measured the spirit of Yehovah? You know, the accents function have a number of functions. One of them is a series of commas and, dash, and, and semicolons mm-hmm. and, and pauses. So they changed the accents, according to the Jewish sources, to make, to make the verse read, who has measured 
the ruach, mm -hmm. which could mean the wind or the spirit, mm -hmm. pause Yehovah. That is, Yehovah is the one who has measured the spirit. Now, that's not what it says in the original <laughs> context, obviously. But that, but they were they You're were saying concerned. That they made it as a pause, pause before Yehovah, right? And why did they do that? They were nervous that someone would come along and say, "Oh, we don't know what a rhetorical question is." There's an answer to this question, and the answer: Who has measured the spirit of Yehovah? Um, you know, I don't know the angel Metatron or the angel Gabriel or something. Mm -hmm. You know, they were afraid of some heresy that might come along and actually give an answer to what is this, what is an uh, not essentially, which is a to what is a rhetorical question. Hmm. And this reminds me of a verse, um, Proverbs 30, verse 4, which Jews also understand to be a rhetorical question, to which the answer is nobody. And last question, you said they changed the vowels of which word? The accents. Are you, the accents. And so what they did here is, let me pull up the accents here, Proverbs 30. Because verse, I'm, I'm seeing sorry, the... Isaiah 40, uh, hold on. Mm -hmm. What verse are we in? 13. 13. Sorry, I'm looking at three different Bibles here. So we have here a tipcha which is a minor pause. Oh, actually, it's a pretty big pause. Mi tikenet ruach, Yehovah. What you should have had probably was something like a munach in mm -hmm. ruach. Mi tiken et ruach Yehovah. Mm -hmm. Who has measured the spirit of Yehovah. That's what you would have expected. Mm -hmm. Impressive. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, that's kind of a more advanced point for those who know about biblical accents. Mm -hmm. And this is actually brought as an example of where... Um, as an exception to the rule where the, where the accents don't actually fit the text. Mm -hmm. And they were probably changed intentionally. You heard it here in, first. In yeah. Jewish sources, meaning this isn't some conspiracy theory of, those Jews are hiding it. No, this is the Jews saying, look, this is what we did. You know, This is what they did. Mm -hmm. All right. With whom did he consult and who gave him understanding? Who taught him in the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge? You know, it's funny as I'm reading this, I just have to be honest with you. Um, as I read this section in Isaiah, I always think about Job, mm -hmm. uh, I, more from the perspective of Yehovah mm -hmm. coming to Job and saying, now, were you there when I did this? And did you do oh, this? Oh, absolutely. Job 38 yeah. through 40. Please, yeah. that's homework. Go read yeah. those chapters. Yeah, you've got to read those chapters. It's a series of rhetorical questions. Mm -hmm. You want answers? That, that's what Job, he's saying to Job. You want the truth? You want the truth? You, can, you yeah. can't even understand the world around you. How yeah. can you understand me, who's an eternal being? Yeah. Man, oh, yeah. man, that's amazing. Probably, uh, and again, that's Yehovah speaking. Job 38 speaking. through 40. Yeah. Yep. Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket. And yeah, regarded as phrase. a speck. Huh? I love that phrase. Do drop, you? Drop in a bucket. <laughs> like that's an expression we have today. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So here's the question. Um, for you, Nehemi, as you're, as you're reading through this, what would, be the, what, would be the, what would be the part that you would say that would be a good challenge for people? In other words. A challenge. Yeah. Like in other know. words, like I'll give you an example. Um, you know, for me, for example, yeah. 21 is... I gotta talk about eighteen. Yeah, go ahead. It says Vel Mitidam Yunel Umadmut Tauhulo. To whom shall you compare God and what is the image that you shall uh, uh, make like him or assess him, mm -hmm. describe him? And and I and I think of Deuteronomy chapter four, verses fifteen to sixteen. And and I should tell people, you know, we've been putting out uh, these prophet pearls and we've asked people to contribute original artwork. Yep. And we've had some amazing artwork that people have submitted, but there have been a couple of them where I had to send it back to the people and say, I can't accept this. And the reason I can't post this is because of Deuteronomy 4, 15 to 16. Mm. Let me read it. It says, You saw no form of any kind the day Yehovah spoke to you at Chorev out of the fire. Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully so that you do not become corrupt and make for yourself an idol, an image of any shape, whether formed like a man or a woman. And so there have been people who were very well-meaning. They had no, you know, nothing negative. They were really devotion, devout people. And they sent me, you know, an image and it had Yehovah represented as a man. And I said, this is a beautiful work of art, but I, I can't use this because this is a violation of Deuteronomy 4, 15 to 16. And they said, oh, wow, I'm so glad you pointed that out because I never thought of it that way. But mm -hmm. there it is. Now, here's the really interesting thing. Um, and this is I'm going to challenge the Christians. You close your ears, Keith. Now, Christians, of course, will have in their church. Now, not in every church, but in many churches, they'll have a um, an, uh, some sort of image of Jesus or Yeshua, who in Christian doctrine, you have the whole Trinity and they say is God. So if he's God, how can we have an image of him? And this is a really interesting thing that I've encountered here in Israel. So um, I've heard this from Christian tour guides and from people who have been on tours. This is a standard thing you'll hear from many tour guides speaking, especially to Catholic groups, but not only. Um, they'll say that um, there's a story in Matthew 15, 22, where the Canaanite woman comes to Jesus 
And, you know, there's a whole interaction. But here's the part the tour guys add in. And they say this is tradition. I don't know what the source is, but they say that. The tour guides. They say that in Matthew 15, 22, this Canaanite woman asked Jesus for permission to make a statue of him to worship. And that according to the tour guide legend, Jesus, this is how they say it, gave her permission. And this permission now extends to all icons and images of Christ. This is how it's described by tour guides. Um, now, of course, this isn't even in the New Testament. But it shows that people in the church are aware of the problem of, 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 of these icons, of these images of what they say is God. Um, and by the way, in the, in the Greek Orthodox Church, there were these huge fights. I don't know if you... Did you learn about this in Trinity Evangelical Divinity School? Do I open is, my ears yet? Uh, you can listen now. Okay. And this is a real question, Chief, Keith. Did you learn about in, in Trinity Evangelical Divinity School about the fight within the Greek Orthodox Church between the iconoclasts and the iconoduals? Mm-mm. Tell me about it. Okay. So the iconoclasts were people who took Deuteronomy 4, 15 to 16 very seriously, and they said, what have we been doing mm-hmm. for hundreds of years having a statue of God? How can we do that? We come and we burn incense to a statue of God and we pray to a statue of God. What about Deuteronomy 4, 15 to 16? This is in the Greek Orthodox Church. And there were wars fought, literally wars and battles fought over the iconoclasts who destroyed. And today, iconoclast is someone, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's an expression in English. But literally, it meant they destroyed the icons. And the opposite group was called the iconoduals from the word uh, doula or doulos in Greek, which means a servant, the mm-hmm. slaves of the icons. And they call themselves that as a sign of honor. And, um, for example, in 738 AD, there was a guy named Leo III, the Asaurian, who was the emperor of the, of the Byzantine Empire. That is the Eastern Roman Empire. We know and him. You know Leo III, the Asaurian? Yeah. Okay. And he, how do you know him? <laughs> no, you don't, never heard of him. All right. He began the first iconoclast reformation to remove the idols from the Greek Orthodox Church. The result was these violent clashes. The icono duel's final victory was declared on March 11th, 843. At something called the Synod of Constantinople. They don't teach us attorney. Yeah. Synod of Constantinople declaring icons legitimate. Now, here's the really interesting thing. The, this event, the uh, Synod of Constantinople, March 11th, 843 AD, is celebrated to this day every year in the Greek Orthodox Church. It's the first Sunday of Lent, and it's called the Feast of Orthodoxy. Mm. And what all this tells me is, even in the Greek Orthodox world, there were people who read this verse, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 18. to figure it out. And Deuteronomy 4, 15 to 16, and they said, wait a minute, what, what are we doing? Mm. We've got a statue of God. We've got mm. a painting of God. We've got this golden uh, you know, image of God, and we're, and, we're, and we're burning incense to him, and we're, and we're praying to the idol and you know, to the statue, and mm. what's going on? And you know, um, So this, this was an issue even within the church. And mm. um, you know, in the Tanakh, it's very clear. Don't make an image of God, not a painting. It doesn't matter if it's beautiful art. Don't do it. There's nothing that you can liken to me, he says. That's the point of, uh, of 4018. Mm-hmm. He, there's nothing and, like him. No image, no likeness. And, and I think that's where the, if I can say the natural application, yeah. it continues with, and Isaiah does a great job in yeah. this. He says, as for the idol, a craftsman casts it. Uh, we already talked about this before. Yeah. I mean, before um, a goldsmith plates it with gold and a silversmith fashions chains of silver. He who is too impoverished for such an offering selects a tree that does not rot. He seeks out for himself a skillful craftsman to prepare an idol that will not totter. So before we get into the next uh, thing, phrase of it, you know, application seems to be pretty clear. Don't create these things that are. Wait, no Christmas trees. Is that where you're going with this? <laughs> I've already I've already talked about that. No idols, no gold, no silver, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. It's hard to be in Israel. I, I will tell you this, and you go into different churches because, yeah. depending on what church and what background, you know, the churches, you know, we can go. We, you know, we could. We we've, we've been in uh, places together where uh, I don't know if you, people know that you've, you've gone with me in some yeah places. into some churches. Yeah, no, and going and you see it, and it, it really is hard. Um, how people are treated. You know, one of the struggles that I have is you go into one place, they say, take your hat off. You go into another place, they say, put your hat on. <laughs> another place, take your hat off. Another place, they put your literally, hat on. Literally. No, literally, take your hat off, take your hat on. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Tradition. Yeah, yeah, tradition. tradition. Yeah, so anyway. Um, anyway, but do you not know? And, and actually, Nehemiah, this is what we talked about l- later when we were in, in uh, episode three. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Mm-hmm. This is actually in that section. Do yeah. you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. What does that mean? Wow. It is he who sits above the circle what of the mean? earth. What does it mean? You look up in the sky. Yeah. If you're atop of a hill and you look around, you see 360 degrees. Mm. You see a circle. And its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. 
Who stretches out the heavens like a curtain mm, grasshoppers. and spreads them Delicious. out like a tent to dwell in? Yeah. Wow. I, I'm done. <laughs> I'm ready to pray. Are you really? Oh, oh you're praying. Well, you're, no, no, no. Pray. It's my turn. But you know what? I want to I wanna ask people to do something. And I know we say this each week. We didn't have our ministry minute. We didn't have it last week either. So um, we didn't talk about it last week. We didn't talk about Tell it this week. Tell us about week. your ministry, Keith. No, no, no. So what I wanted to do is this. I really, I, What I love about the, the concept of going through this is that you, you, you can get so much depth from each word. Oh, my gosh. To. We could spend the whole, the whole time on the word grasshoppers. I mean, I literally <laughs> could spend 45 minutes of grasshoppers. No, you really could. <laughs> we, could we, sure. They, <laughs> very delicious. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Or what we could do is we first try to get the big picture and then you start going, you know, step by step by step. Yeah. I'm actually going to ask people to do us a favor. Do me a favor. I'm actually going to ask you to do a favor because at this point we're into August, I believe. We're just about the end of July or mm. the beginning of August. And by now we have many, many August people first. that are learning to take bite sized pieces of scripture <clears throat> and to learn, uh, learn it. I will say something really interesting. I'm here past time. So by the time you hear this, here's what will have happened. We will have created the entire curriculum and you'll be looking at it, but we need your help. We need people to actually go through it and to make it better because soon at the end of Prophet Pearls, when we finish Prophet Pearls and it's time for the second cycle, we want to actually make this public for people so that they can just go in and start digging in, in themselves and use Prophet Pearls and Torah Pearls and Scripture Bites and uh, all the series and all these things together so that when we start talking about something like this is what the grammatical structure is and this is what the word is and this is what the vowels are, a person can actually use the information to to connect. So go to BFAInternational.com on the front page. It will still be up. Uh, scripture Bites, um, it'll be, it's, it's, it's a, uh, uh, it's basically a biblical Hebrew audio course that'll help you use some of that information to do what it is that Nehemiah and I are doing. Not at the same level, and, and, and obviously, because we've got, this guy's gone. I mean, Nehemiah, I don't know how many years you've been involved. Pretty evangelical yeah, yeah, yeah. school you went We've got all these, these, <laughs> these things, but I want to say in humility, one of the things that's a blessing for me is to continue to learn, and yeah. that's part oh, of man. the process. Oh, man, so, it's a lifelong process. Yes. And here's my ministry minute. Go over to NehemiahsWall.com, go to this week's episode, Isaiah 40, verses 1 to 26, and post one comment. I don't care if it's a comment that somebody else has said. Read the verse, read the passage, these these 26 verses, pray about them, and then post one impression, one thought, anything. Um, So my ministry minute is for you to be part of the ministry, to come to the website and share your your feelings, your thought, your impressions, whatever they are. Mm -hmm. Please just come and, and be respectful of others always. And, uh, you know, and share what you got, whether it's one line or whether it's the 10 page, uh, you know, thing you want to post, nehemiaswall.com. Also sign up for the free newsletter and uh, come become part of the support team. Get involved. Be part of the ministry. Mm. Let's pray. Oh, man. To whom then will you liken me? This is what you say, Father, that who can we liken to you? Who can be your equal? Uh, There are none for you are God and there is no other. You are you are the everything, and so we uh, come to you right now, and we ask for your for your uh, humility to be people that would um, take your word and apply it into our lives. We thank you so much for um, all the things that you've given to us, and all those that you've sent um, to remind us of who you are. So we pray for your blessing and your protection, um, and and your diligence. Uh, we pray for diligence for those that are studying that you give them diligence of heart and mind and focus to be able to open your word and to ask what it means for them. In your precious name, we thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening to Prophet Pearls with Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson. For more information, please visit nehemiaswall.com and bfainternational.com.